here's what I'm going to do tonight. I didn't just come with a message to preach. This isn't a three-point message for you to take notes and maybe study later. I've come tonight with a declaration over the people, and I feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit right now, to make a declaration over the people of Twin Rivers Church that no matter what you faced in 2020, and I, I think it's amazing. I didn't even realize this was the first night until just recently. God stirred in my heart the message I was to preach. I want tonight to be your reset button. I don't care what happened in 2020, what you went through in 2020, what happened in our world in 2020. Tonight we're hitting that spiritual reset button. Just reach up and hit that spiritual reset button. And here's what I want you to shout. It's Genesis time. Say it again, it's Genesis time. time. See, that's the word that God put in my heart to speak over Twin Rivers Church. You are in a Genesis moment. And I don't think it's any accident that I was was impressed to preach this message on the first night of this revival in the first month of this new year. Because I believe this is going to be a year of new beginnings. I believe it's going to be a year of new beginnings in the people's lives that are here. People that are listening and watching all over the world, somebody shout, it's Genesis time. That means new horizons, new opportunities, new favor is coming on your life. There's going to be some challenges in 2021, but I got a word for you. There's going to be a new anointing for those challenges that are coming on your life. It's a new day, and your God is doing a new thing, and you're a part of it. I believe it's a new time for people's hearts, people's minds. I'm speaking a Genesis time over your marriages and over your families. I'm speaking a Genesis time over your health and over your healing. I'm speaking a Genesis time over your homes. I'm speaking a Genesis time over Twin Rivers Church. I know this place has been here for a little while, but I believe what takes place this year is going to take this church into a whole new dimension and a whole new level of God's glory and anointing like this place has never seen before. I'm believing it's a Genesis time for your finances. I believe you're going to get, you're about to step into a miracle year for God to bless you financially. You say, is that even possible? My Bible tells me that in the last days, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. I believe we're living in the last days, and I believe that there's about to be a transfer onto the righteous, and not just so we can live large and in charge, but so we can continue to fund the gospel of Jesus Christ until everybody has heard the message of salvation. Shout, it's Genesis time. I believe it's a year of blessing. You say, but there's so much going on. God never consults the culture to determine whether or not he's going to bless you. He will bless you in the middle of a culture that's going the wrong direction. He will bless you in the middle of circumstances that are coming against your life. I looked up the word blessing. One of the definitions of the word blessing is to cause your life to move forward. Now, I thought that was interesting because why would God have to bless me to move forward unless there was something trying to push me backward or hold me captive where I am? But when the blessing of God shows up, whatever was trying to push you back has to relent because God's blessing is pushing you forward. Here's another thing I read about blessing. The word blessing means to flow like a river. And when I read that and I thought I'm about to preach at Twin Rivers Church, and if the blessing means that your life is going to flow like a river, that means God is taking you to a predetermined destination. I'm not just in River Church, I'm in Twin River Church. That means I'm in Double Blessing Church. You have no idea what you're sitting in right now. You are in Double, Double Blessing Church. Give Jesus a big praise right now. Say Genesis time. In Psalms chapter 51, verses 10 through 12, you could probably quote this. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture. Verse 10 says, it's David praying here, and here's what he says. Create in me a clean heart, O God, 
and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. God's wanting to create something new in people's lives this year. I read this this same scripture in a different translation. I like to do that sometimes just to see if I can get a little bit more out of it. And I found this in the message translation. I want you to listen how the message translation reads in this same scripture. God, make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. Don't throw me out with the trash or fail to breathe holiness in me. Bring me back from gray exile. Put a fresh wind in my sails. You hear what David is praying? Create a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. You say, what's a Genesis week? I'll tell you what a Genesis week is. A Genesis week is where God is speaking and things are happening. And we're stepping into a Genesis week or a Genesis year. You're stepping into a Genesis moment where God's going to be speaking and things around you are going to start happening. In Genesis week, God said, let there be light, there's light. God said, let there be earth, let there be land, there's land. God said, let there be trees, there's trees. Whatever God says happens, is happening. But when God is working in Genesis in that first chapter, in that first week, he does it with order. Your God is a God of order. So wherever you see disorder, just know God has no part of that. Another word for disorder is chaos. The Bible says that the devil is the author of chaos and confusion, not your God. God is a God of order. Now when he shows up in this first Genesis week, his order was purpose, word, creation. Now we think it was word, creation, purpose. But that's not how your God works. God's order is purpose, word, creation. In other words, nothing is created that didn't first have a purpose. So I don't care what your mom and dad told you. If you are alive right now, there is no such thing as an accident. You would have never been created had God not first had a purpose for your life. Jeremiah said it like this. Before you even formed me in my mother's womb, you called me by name and determined I would be a prophet to the nations. In other words, God established your purpose, then you came into existence. So if you are here tonight, if you are breathing, inhaling, and exhaling, then there was a purpose for you being here at this moment, at this time, in this place. When God shows up in Genesis and he has the purpose, he says, I've got this purpose. I, got, I created this beautiful sky, but now I need something in the sky. So he had the purpose of flight and he goes and he creates a bird. He speaks a bird into existence. And then you know what God does? He takes the flight and puts it inside the bird and the bird goes into the sky. God said, I got this huge ocean. What am I going to do with it? I know. I need, I'm going to put swim in the ocean. But if I've got the purpose of swim, then I need something to put the swim in. So God speaks and all these sea creatures come to being. And God takes the swim and puts it in the sea creatures. God did not create a whale and wonder, what am I going to have this whale do? The whole reason there's a whale was because God had a swim. The whole reason there's a bird is because God had fly. So God has purpose before he has creation. Purpose, word, creation. And all of creation follows the same pattern until the sixth day. And once we come to the sixth day, God still starts with purpose. But this is where it's different. Where everything else was spoken into existence. When it came to us, God said, I'm going to have to get my hands dirty for this one. 
and he reaches down into the dust of the ground and he forms us. And after he forms man, then he speaks into man. Everything else he spoke into existence except us. He formed us and then spoke into us. Why? Because everything you see was created to exist, but you were you exist to create. And the way you exist to create is the same way God created everything that exists. So now we walk in that same order that God established all the way from Genesis. We walk in the purpose of God, speaking the word of God, creating the world that we live in. If you don't like the world you're living in, then check your words and make sure your words are lining up with God's purpose. Because whatever you're saying is creating a world you're going to have to live in. Because God breathed life on the inside of you. And God gave three commands to man and woman that he did not give to any of his other creation. He did not set birds down. And he did not bring the hippopotamus over and say, now here's what I want you to do. No, they had the purpose in them. They went on. They're doing exactly what God created them to do. But us... He comes to us and says, here's your command. I command you to walk with dominion, and I command you to be fruitful, and I command you to multiply. Now, the first thing God started with was dominion. Everybody say dominion. Now, how did man take dominion? Was he stronger than the animals? Nope. The elephant's much stronger than we are. The lion is much stronger than we are. But the Bible says that God and Adam would walk through the garden and see the animals, and God would say, Adam, speak to the animal and tell him what he is. And whenever Adam spoke, he took dominion over that creation. So in other words, God said, I want you to have dominion on this planet. He did not give dominion to a spirit. He gave dominion to flesh. The devil is a spirit. He is not flesh. So every time during worship you clap your hands, you remind the devil God gave dominion to you and not to him. Satan has no authority on this earth because authority was given to flesh. Am I preaching to anybody up in here today? My pastor taught it to me like this. There's a scripture in your Bible. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me, but behold, I give this authority unto you. And you now have authority to trample over all the enemy's authority. You now have authority over all the authority of the enemy. That's what Jesus said. Now, this seems counterintuitive. We have authority over all the authority of the enemy, but Jesus, I thought you just said, Satan doesn't have any authority. I went back and I read the translation of the two words authority. Now, the first one was interpreted correctly. We have authority. The second one is interpreted ability. And what this means is you have authority over all the ability of the enemy. What's that tell me? The devil's got some ability. Here's what my pastor explained to me. He said, you can have this big semi-truck out in the middle of a road, but you let a little police officer walk out there in the middle of that traffic stop and just hold up their hand, and that semi-truck will come to a screeching halt. Now, which one has the most ability? The semi-truck. But which one, because of that little badge on their chest, has authority? The police officer. What am I saying to you today? Is the devil big? You better believe it. Is the devil bad? You better believe it. Can he make you sick? Can he make you depressed? Can he make you fit? Can he fill you with fear? You better believe it. He has ability, but because you walk in the dominion power of Jesus Christ, you can take authority over all of the devil's ability. Where is this authority? It's in your mouth. Is anybody else kind of amazed that a pandemic hit the world that is transferred from people's mouths 
And one of the first things governments did was put masks on people. I'm not saying don't wear masks. That's not what I'm preaching here tonight. But the first thing governments did was put masks on people and then tell them whenever you go to church, if you can even go to church, whatever you do, don't sing and don't shout. It's almost as if the enemy knows whenever the church gets together and opens their mouth and starts singing and starts praising and starts worshiping and starts speaking the word of God and starts shouting glory unto God that the devil starts losing his ability because the church is taking authority. I hope if you don't get anything else from this sermon, you walk into your home tonight. If the enemy has been moving in your home, I dare you to start on the top floor and go through every bedroom upstairs and tell the devil, get out of my kid's bedroom. You demonic spirit of fear, get out of their bedroom. You demonic spirit of oppression, get out. Go down, kick them out of the kitchen. Kick them out of the family room. Oh, your neighbors may think you're crazy, but who cares? Open your front door and tell Tell the devil, by the authority of Jesus Christ, get out of my house. Somebody shout unto God right now. Come on. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Shout unto God with the voice of authority. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Somebody take authority over fear right now. Somebody take authority over sickness right now. Somebody take authority over depression. I command joy overflowing, full of the Holy Ghost to flow through people's lives. And then he said, be fruitful and multiply. Now, on the surface level, it seems like that's the same command he gave to all other creation. Right? All creation is supposed to be fruitful and multiply, except for the fact that there's more to you than meets the eye. You are a triune being. There are three parts of you sitting here tonight, spirit, soul, body. There's a spirit. There's a soul. Soul is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions, and then you have a body. So when God gave you the command to multiply, It was more than just bodily multiplication. God wanted you to multiply a spirit. He wanted you to take the spirit of joy and multiply it. He wanted you to take the spirit of creativity and multiply it. God wanted you that when you walk into a room, your spirit becomes contagious and infectious to everybody you get around. Because what's in you is greater than anything that's in the world. Christ in you, the Holy Ghost is on the inside of you. So when you walk into a room, demonic spirits start backing up because your spirit's about to multiply. Your spirit's about to become contagious. And then he said this. He said, be fruitful. Notice he did not give them the command to be faithful. A lot of church people think God gave them the command to be faithful. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with being faithful. I'm thankful you're here tonight because you're faithful, right? I'm thankful that you're here. I'm thankful that you're faithful and you're giving. That's all good. But what good is it if you are faithful and never fruitful? When Jesus walked past a tree, he noticed there was no fruit on it. Him and his disciples traveled. When they came back, the tree was still there. It was faithful. But Jesus cursed it because it had no fruit. If there is not fruit coming from your life, then there is no blessing of God on your life. God does not just bless those who are faithful. God blesses those who are fruitful. That's a good word right there. See, I believe it's Genesis time. I believe it's Genesis time. And we are creative, but God's the creator, and we can't do anything without the breath of life. I thank God for, man, you guys have some tremendous worship in this house. What an amazing team. Can you let them know how much you love and appreciate them? I mean, wow. Really, wow. That was fantastic. But without the breath of God, you just watched a show. Thank God for small groups. 
but without the breath of God, they're just another community social. We must have the breath of God on everything we do. I want the breath of God when I go to work. I want his breath on my life. I want God's breath on my home. Because wherever God breathes, there's creation taking place. Wherever God breathes, things are multiplying and miracles are happening. Now David is praying this. And listen to this again. God, make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. Don't throw me out with the trash or fail to breathe holiness in me. Bring me back from gray exile. Put a fresh wind in my sails. David, he's in a place of chaos. Now, make no mistake about it, this is self-inflicted chaos. He's in a place of chaos because he has had an affair with a woman by the name of Bathsheba. He didn't just commit a sin, he committed sins. And then he has her husband put on the front line and murdered and killed. And according to Jewish law, Jewish tradition, both of these sins were unforgivable and should have been punished by death. This is what David is feeling. This is the weight. He knows what he deserves. But he doesn't go to man to talk about it. He turns to God and says, God, if I go to man, they'll never forgive me. But if I come to you, God, I know what you can do. I know how you can step, in, step into messed up places and create something beautiful out of it. So God, rather than turn to them and they're going to want to put me to death, God, I'm turning to you in the chaos of my life. Let me, can I just ask a question? Was 2020 chaotic for anybody other than me? Can we just be honest for a second? Does anybody else feel like 2020 was chaos? Now let's be honest. Some of you brought it on yourself. You did, just admit it, it's okay. Some of you stepped into chaos because of somebody else's bad decision. You didn't do anything to bring it. They brought it on you. I remember a season I went through, and let me tell you something about pastors. My God. Do you know how incredible pastors are? I mean, do you really know how amazing pastors are? Especially through 2020, there wasn't one pastor that had ever pastored through a pandemic before. We were all figuring it out. And your pastor, no matter which decision they made, it was going to be wrong. Let's keep church open. That's the wrong decision. Let's shut church down. That's the wrong decision. Make everybody wear a mask. You have no faith. We're not going to wear a mask. You have no wisdom. And no matter what decision they made, it was going to be the wrong decision. Now, on top of that, add an election year. That one hit home right there. I felt, felt a connection. And now everything a pastor preached from the Bible is political. I remember... We went through a season last summer. Now, here we'd been through this whole pandem pandemic. We tried to figure it out the whole time. I mean, just we're exhausted. It's at the end of summer. And somebody didn't like my message. So you know what they did. They did what the Bible says. They came to me and me alone. No. <laughs> they went to Facebook and Facebook alone. And they put it all out there. And then you know what? It's just so interesting. It's, it's uh, sometimes bad spirits are like magnets. And they attract the same thing to them. They just all, now out of nowhere, all these people are joining together to take down Pastor Eric on social media. Because he preached the Bible. But we know he had political motives behind it. And they, you would not believe some of the things that came out. Just awful things. Horrific things. My staff paid a price. Our family paid a price. Our church paid a price. Nothing causes me to lose sleep. There's a verse in your Bible that says he gives his beloved rest. So I said, there's no point in both of us staying awake about it. If you don't sleep, I am. So I'll let you stay awake and deal with it, God. But on this one, I, even, I was losing sleep. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't rest. I couldn't eat. My life 
felt like it was just swirling in chaos. Somebody posted something, and it was just on the wrong day for me. You ever had one of those moments where you're just not all the way saved yet? You're just, you're almost, but you're just not all the way saved. And somebody posted something, and it was a blatant lie. I mean, just a horrific, blatant lie. And I had all this proof. And I opened up my computer, and I started typing. And I mean, I had a big old paragraph. I had, I had all these case points. and all. I mean, I had everything written out. And God spoke to me and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm setting the record straight. And God spoke to me and said, shut up. Does he talk to you like that? He said, shut up. And I said, but God, I've been through so much now. I've, I've got to do something about this, God. They are lying, and I've got to set this record straight. This is not true. And he said, Eric, he said, if any part of them really doubted your relationship with me, they would have never posted that. Because they would have never picked a fight with somebody who didn't really have a relationship with me. The fact that you're in relationship with me, they know they can target you and you won't respond. I want to say that to somebody in this room tonight. Sometimes your enemy will target you because he knows you won't respond the way somebody unsaved would respond. God said, keep quiet, let me handle this. That was just a little bit of my chaos. What was your chaos? Lost job? Sickness? Fear? Not knowing which way this pandemic's going to go? Not knowing how bad is it really? And can I tell you what I've learned about chaos and what I learned through that season? Chaos doesn't care about your job. Chaos doesn't care about your money. Chaos doesn't care about any of those things. Chaos comes for one thing, your heart. Because if it can get your heart, it's got your words. Your Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So chaos knows if I can get your heart, I'll keep you in chaos the rest of your life. And not only you, you'll pass chaos down to your children and your children's children. And they'll have to put up with the same mess that you allowed. Chaos was coming after my heart. Chaos came after your heart. The root of chaos is the word abyss. The word abyss, think about abyss, it's just like falling and, and there's, there's no bottom to the hole you're falling in, but it also means out of order. And now I know why David was praying, God, give me a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. My life is out of order, but God, if you'll step back in, purpose, word, creation's about to take place. I don't need anything else, God. I just need you to step into this moment with purpose, word, and there will be creation and create a Genesis week. In other words, David was saying, God, can we just start all over again? Can we just hit the reset button and start this thing all over afresh? Because when God creates, he's speaking. And I've come to tell somebody the reason chaos came against your life was because a long time ago, there was a seed planted in your life. And the enemy was watching the ground better than you were. And he knows the seed is about to become fruitful. So he hit you with chaos at the time of harvest. The enemy doesn't mess with you when God's planting the seed. The enemy doesn't mess with you when the seed's lying dormant underground. No, the enemy starts messing with you when it's about time for harvest. And the enemy put it, the enemy has brought weeds into your life for this moment, but God put a seed in your life for this moment. And that seed is coming to pass in this season. Say this with me God, put a seed in me for this moment. And you may say, well, I can't do a lot, Pastor. I have no control what's going on with my life. Well, guess what? You're a perfect candidate for a Genesis moment, you're a perfect candidate for a Genesis time. Well, I have nothing to offer to God. Good. Jesus said it like this. With God, nothing is impossible. 
Now, I know how we read that with God. Nothing is impossible. But I read it a little bit differently one time. I read it like this. With God, nothing, that's impossible. In other words, you can't come to God with nothing and him not do something. So if you feel like you got a nothing marriage, bring it to God. He'll do something with it. You feel like no future for your children, bring them to God. He'll do something with it. You feel like you've got a nothing dream or a nothing vision or a nothing purpose, bring it to God and he'll do something with it. Nothing that's impossible with your God. Pastor, I don't know. It's going to take somebody a lot smarter to bring me out of this. I read this one time. I thought this was interesting. The ark was built by an amateur. The Titanic was built by professionals. (laughs) Here's what David prays. God, restore to me my joy. You can come to the music. I'm almost done. God, restore to me my joy. In other words... Can we just go back to the beginning? Can we go back, God? Does anybody remember the night you got saved? Or the day you got saved? Do you remember how you just loved everybody? Even your enemies? I mean, you just loved everybody. You forgave everybody because you realized how much God had forgiven you of. And you were just overwhelmed. What happens to believers, the longer we're in this thing, the more cynical we become, the more judgmental we become, the less forgiving we become, the less worshipful and thankful we become. So David prays, God, can we go back to the beginning? And can you give me that same joy I had when I first got saved? Here's what I've come to speak over Twin Rivers Church. God is bringing you into a Genesis moment and he's going to form it out of the chaos of your life. David said, when I don't know where to turn, I know who to turn to because I've seen what he's done with moments like this. I've read, David had read Genesis. David had read, the, the, he had read what God did in that first week. He had read it. He had read how the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And then he read on the first day God, on the second day God, on the third day God, and on the fourth day God, and on the fifth day God, and on the sixth day God. He had read everything God did. So he runs back to God and he said, God, I know you did it back then. Can you do it again? But this time, I don't need it on a global scale. Just do it in the, on the inside of me. Can you create a Genesis week from the chaos of my life, Lord? Give me that joy back that I once felt. Give me that power and that purpose I used to feel, God. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. And I don't know if David thought about this or not, because notice what he said. He said, don't take your spirit from me. Why did he say that? He was thinking back to Genesis. The earth was formless and without void and without form, and darkness was over the face of the deep. But the spirit of the Lord was hovering over the face of the water. What I love about that is that in the middle of the chaos, the Holy Ghost was waiting and watching. And one word from the Father, and the Holy Ghost went into action. And the Holy Ghost went into action, and whenever the Holy Ghost goes into action, there's joy, there's peace, there's love, there's forgiveness, there's purpose, there's power. There's power. There's supernatural miracle working power. There's dominion. There's creative power. Whenever the Holy Ghost starts to move, all these miracles, signs, and wonders start showing up at the same time. And what I've come to say to somebody tonight is regardless of the chaos you felt like your life is in, the Holy Ghost is hovering in this place right now. And he's just waiting on somebody to look up and say, God, will you do it again? Will you do it again? Can you stand to your feet with me all over this room? And I don't know who I'm preaching to, but if that's you, I dare you to lift your hands and say, God, I know you've done it before, but 
can you do it again tonight? Can you, can you give us a Genesis week in our marriage, a Genesis week in our family? God, can you give me a Genesis week in my health? Can you give me a, a Genesis week, God, in my finances? We need a financial miracle, God. Create a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. Come on. Right now, I want you to ask him, do it again, do it again, because I believe the Holy Ghost is hovering in this place, just waiting on that person to invite him to spring into action. It's Genesis time. It's Genesis time. It's Genesis time. Come on, ask him, ask him, it's Genesis time. If 2020 was chaos, God can begin to go into motion and form something out of all of that chaos it's Genesis time. You all can begin to sing, and we're just going to worship. And I want you to let the Holy Ghost, wherever the chaos is, invite him into that chaos and say, give me a Genesis week in this moment right now. Hey, what's up, guys? We hope that this message you just heard blessed you. To always get our newest messages and to stay up to date, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click that bell icon to be notified every time we upload. Now, while you're here, go ahead and check out our page and some other messages we've got, and we'll see you next time.